And Daryl, can you see everyone okay? Yeah, I can. Okay. okay. I can't see Jen, but uh, that's okay. If you hit the view up in the upper right hand corner and switch it to gallery, um, you should be able to see all the all the people in here. Yep. Good point. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> I, see I have to say that uh, I have another meeting, uh, which begins at about seven o'clock. So I'm going to have to leave shortly before seven. Sorry about that. Hey, Andy, let's get moving. I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Corporate Services Committee to order May, Monday, May the 2nd, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Call to order and roll call. Okay, uh, Citizen Member Andy Tamas. Uh, Daryl O'Shaughnessy. Yes. Chris Cooper. Here. Vice Chair Lisa McGee and Chair Ted Strike. Here. Uh, land acknowledgement statement. <clears throat> I would like to begin to acknowledge acknowledging that the land in which we work and gather is in the territorial unceded, uh, traditional unceded territory of the uh, Anishawa Bay people. The Algonquin Nation have lived on this land for thousands of years long before the arrival of the European settlers. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. Adoption of the agenda. Be resolved that the agenda for the Corporate Services Advisory Committee meeting of Monday, May 2nd, 2022 be adopted. Move yep. please. Andy, Daryl, all in favor, carried. Any disclosure, disclosure of pecuniary interest? None. None. Adoption of the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, March 7th. That the Corporate Services Advisory Committee approve the minutes listed under item 6A on the agenda being March 7th, 2022. Mover, please. Chris, Daryl, all in favor? Yep. I wasn't there, so I can't approve it. No. <laughs> Except there's one small error. Or I have a question, actually. Go ahead, Ed. Uh, it said everybody was present, but it also said that I was absent. <laughs> okay. Well, I will fix that. My apologies. Thank you for that note. We have uh, three presentations tonight. Uh, the first one is the Water Lake Adjustment Policy. The Corporate Services Advisory Committee received the Water Lake Adjustment Policy presentation as information. Mover, please. Chris, Daryl. And I will put up the presentation for you momentarily, Jen. <clears throat> so good evening, everyone. Um, so over the last uh, couple months that I've been in my role, um, we've been reviewing some uh, policies in place. And one of the policies that we noted that uh, could use a little bit of revamp was the water leak adjustment policy. And um, this policy was implemented back in 2010. Um, so um, it's already in place. Um, it's just basically to give some kind of financial relief to, um, to those that may be on a, um, on a, a strict income and um, is able to assist them um, if, if there is a leak and um, it, it resulted in a high water bill. So in 2009, the town implemented a new water metering system using Neptune water meters. And upon the transition, bylaw 5923-10 was established for water leak adjustments. However, since implemented, staff have recommended that as for best practices, this policy shall be reviewed at least every five years to evaluate its effectiveness and to update it as necessary. From 2019 to 2021 on average, there was approximately three to five water leak adjustments per year that have been uh, issued, valuing a total of $1,583 annually to assist ratepayers with financial relief. Uh, what's good about this is the town rec about this policy is that the town recognizes the importance of assisting residential customers who utilize town services with limited financial relief um, for high water consumption due to leaks. So um, under procedures during each 
bi-monthly billing, staff will identify possible leaks provided by the water meter leak detection report and notify customers with a water leak notification letter. Customers who have received an unusually high water bill or leak notification letter will have the opportunity to invest the investigate the leak and contact the town to inquire if they're eligible for a water leak adjustment. So there's some eligibility requirements that we've added into this policy. So an account holder may apply for credit in respect of the account holder's property if the property is serviced by the town's water supply system, that it has a properly functioning and accessible internal shutoff valve. And during a one year period prior to the abnormal use sorry, my screen has not failed to respond to a request from town staff for access to the proper property's water meter. So in some instances, we'll, we need access um, just for maintenance, general maintenance. Um, so we wanna ensure that the, that the property owners are, are um, complying with this. Um, that the property owner has not engaged in or taken advantage of fraudulent or misleading behavior relating to the credit program, such as tampering with the water meter or supply misinformation and they must possess a water bill identifying at least two times the average monthly consumption so that we don't have um, just anybody that has like an abnormal spike um, because of maybe relatives or you know uh, being in town um, that they obviously have to have a, a problem with one of their um, with one of their fixtures and that they have successful successfully repaired the leak and provided a leak adjustment form with all supporting documentation to the town within four months of the repair being made. So application requirements. To apply for the credit, the account holder must submit a completed water leak adjustment form along with proof of repair at the owner's expense, carry out all actions as outlined in this water leak adjustment policy, provide consent to the town to access their property, private property for the purpose of an inspection should it be, be deemed necessary, have a utility account in good standing and agree that there will be no extension to the due date of the time for paying water and wastewater bills due to any pending adjustment request, and pay the portion of all fees and charges owing that are not eliminated by the water leak adjustment credit. So there are exceptions. Um, any water use or loss from the following factors are not eligible for a leak adjustment credit. So theft or fraudulent activity, vandalism, outdoor water use, such as but not limited to irrigation, pool, basin, hot tub billing, hose, outdoor cleaning and maintenance or a skating rink. Any action by a third party from whom the account, hold, the account holder is able to recover, recover the account holder's loss. Costs that, be, can, that can be recovered through an insurance claim neglect of the property or an occurrence in a property where, although the property is ordinary occupant, occupied, the occupants were absent for more than three days without routine property checks. So the calculation of the credit is, is the same that it is right now. Um, it will be determined by comparing the average daily water consumption for the period, for the leak period to the average daily water consumption for the two most recent billings after the repair has been made. The quantity of the excess water and sewer consumption resulting from this analysis will determine the cubic meters for credit. And does anybody have any questions? I'd also like to note on this, uh, this policy too, it's also uh, an opportunity to educate um, ratepayers on water conservation. Um, it's able to identify problems. Um, it helps them understand um, because the town has to pay for treating the water. Um, so, you know, any education that we can have to help them um, to uh, rectify the leak as soon as possible um, benefits the town as well. So if I could ask a question. Andy, um, yeah. the, it, this applies for leaks on the part of the water system on the, on the property owner, uh, on the property of, of, of the rate payer, the person that's, that's paying for. Uh, so leaks that would occur on municipal property, on municipal lands are over and above this, are outside well, the, the purview of this? Yeah, so what happens is that the, the water main comes in from the curbside and it actually doesn't go through the meter until it enters the property. And mm -hmm. once it enters the property, it's inside the, um, and that's where it starts measuring, once inside the uh, ratepayer's 
uh, uh, residents. Well, so you don't so know that you have a leak. Leaks, uh, like the, on, the, on the, the only way you. Side. Sorry. So the only way you know you have an excess consumption is after water leaking after it's through the meter. That's right, because they'll okay. only get charged if there's a leak on their side of the property. If it's on the municipal side, it hasn't gone through the meter, so they're not charged for it. Okay, that would be well, like a like it would be ground appearance of. Well, that's so obvious. My question is kind of dumb. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no dumb questions, no Andy. Problem. <laughs> that's right. Anybody else, Chris? Uh, when a leak notification letter is sent, is it sent to the landlord if it's a rental place, or to the residents that are there, or is it sent to both? Well, all water accounts right now in the account holder so the owner of the property uh, we do not have tenant billing um, so basically the owner of the property uh, is the one who receives the notice okay um, one other question is it possible I know it's being sent by letter right now is it possible to contact a ratepayer or the account holder by email or like robocall or phone um, I'm just envisioning if you had a leak uh, on a Friday night and the letter's not going to go out and get to the the person until se several days later whereas a phone call or an email if we had it on file um, could notify them and maybe mitigate the leak almost immediately just because we were talking about like it being a timely thing yes so so basically what happens is that, that leak this leak notification letter will be sent out with the water bills um so these reports will be generated when we actually do a billing so they'll be notified um with with um the owner uh, uh, however if it's a substantial leak um you know we we are talking about um uh, reviewing our um, standard operating procedures. So, you know, that that's something that, you know, just a phone call, um, trying to get a hold of the land, uh, the homeowner, if we we're able to, um, is definitely a possibility for sure. Okay, so that might be something that could go into the policy is that if it's, I was just thinking, like, if someone's got a catastrophic leak, and they have no idea, um, I know I'd like to know about it before um, a letter gets to me or before the next billing cycle. So that is something that's possible to do then. I think it would be yeah. a good question too for people to sign up for e-billing because if yeah. you get your bill by e-billing, well then you'll also get this by email, which is faster than than snail mail, right? So yeah, that's and that it goes will, into the education piece that that Jennifer was talking about. That's good. Yeah, and it will be it will be the billing that when we're going through the bill, billing register that will really pick up on the on the bill. So prior to the bills getting mailed out, we always have that opportunity. You know, if we see something substantial value. Um, to contact the to contact the homeowner. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Where do these leaks occur in a house or in a building? Do they occur like uh, at a untended uh, outdoor faucet or something like that? Usually toilets, uh, Not sink. Not the tenants uh, of faulty toilets. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, sometimes they're outdoor taps. Those are the tricky ones because um, if they have an outdoor tap that, you know, maybe froze um, over the winter and it's cracked a bit um, and is dripping on the outside, it's going into the ground. So those are a little bit harder to detect. Um, however, we do have methods, um, elimination methods on how to detect um, your, which faucet could be the, uh, the guilty culprit. Um, and and uh, basically we uh, suggest those um, those methods to the homeowners to help them identify. Um, and um, if, if they fall, you know, if all those methods fail, then then we um, we tell them that maybe they should contact a plumber um, to come and take a look. But we, we do have a, a quite a bit of methods that we, we offer to help them as, uh, to assist them. And um, and a lot of these uh, these methods have helped detect um, even uh, like the toilet, the dye in the back of the toilets. And, um, you know, just a, you, if you turn off all of your valves in your house and you read your water meter, it should be zero. And then one by one, you turn a valve back on for each fixture. You're able to identify um, once the meter starts reading, which, which fixture is the guilty culprit. Mm -hmm. That's right. Toilets can sometimes just run on and on. Yep, you're right. Yeah. Anybody else? If not, uh, all in favor to accept this uh, 
um, report yep. as information. Carried. Yep, looks good to me. Uh, next presentation is the 22 municipal election. Uh, that Corporate Services Advisory Committee received the 22 municipal election update presentation as information. Over, please. Carol, Andy. Yep. Okay. So, oddly enough, today is the first day of nominations. <laughs> so we thought we better bring some kind of report on elections forward. Um, uh, so Kayla and I are all about elections this week. Yep. Yeah. There you go. So just a bit of background, and we just wanted to um, reiterate uh, something that we've brought here before, but the 2022 Municipal and School Board election uh, voting day is October 20th. 20, sorry, October 24th, 2022. And as uh, we have done in the past, we will be bringing forward the advanced voting period for 10 days. So from October 14th to 23rd. Um, the municipal offices for which persons may be nominated include the following, uh, one mayor, one county councillor and five councillors. All members of Armpar Town Council are elected at large. The deputy mayor is appointed on a rotational basis and the county councillor represents the town at Renfrew County Council. With regards to the school board, um, uh, this in the 2022 municipal election, there, um, the town of Armpar will be running the English public school trustee uh, election. And that is for the uh, town of Armpar and the township of McNabb side. We have the highest number of electors in that category. So we run that election. We will also be running the English Catholic School Board uh, trustee election for the Town of Armpire, the Township of McNabb Brayside, and the Township of Greater Madawaska. Again, we have the largest number of um, Catholic uh, separate school uh, voters in that election, so we'll be running it. And then both French Public and French Catholic School Board trustees are being run in 2022 by the Town of Petawawa. So the nomination period began this morning at 8.30 a.m. Um, nominations can be filed in the clerk's office at Town Hall during regular business hours, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday to Friday from today until August 18th, 2022. Um, and the last day for uh, nominations is August 19th from 9 till 2 p.m. And we are not accepting electronic nominations in the town of Armprior. So you have to physically come in and submit your uh, paper nomination forms to the clerk or, and or deputy clerk. Uh, to file a nomination, candidates must provide the following, a complete nomination form, a completed nomination form, form one, the nomination filing fee, which is $200 for the head of council and $100 for all other offices, and a completed endorsement of nomination form. Uh, that's form two, um, and that is the form that is requiring 25 signatures of endorsement. And then when filing out the nomination form, the candidate must write down their name as they want it to appear on the ballot. Uh, so again, the, the 25 signatures for, uh, for the nomination form two, uh, who are eligible, they must be eligible to vote in the municipality. Those who endorse a candidate will also be declaring that they were eligible to vote when they provided the endorsement. And if a candidate chooses to run for a different office on the same municipal council, they do not have to resubmit another 25 signatures. Their first 25 were fine. Uh, so candidates are eligible to file nominations for municipal office if you are a Canadian citizen, at least 18 years of age, a resident, non-resident owner or tenant or spouse, not prohibited from voting as noted in the act or otherwise by law, not disqualified for violation of financial requirements and not disqualified for any other reason by any act or under the Municipal Elections Act. Candidates are eligible to file nominations for school board trustee if you are an elector, qualified to be a member of the school board in accordance with the Education Act, which means you reside in the school board's area of jurisdiction and you're qualified to vote for members of that school board, and you're not prohibited from voting as noted in the act or otherwise by bylaw. By law. 
A person can only be nominated for one office at a time. If a person files more than one nomination, then the most recent nomination is in effect and the prior nomination is deemed withdrawn. And a person's name can only appear on one ballot. The clerk certifies nominations by August 22nd, 2022 for the initial nominations and August 25th for additional nominations when we have received insufficient nominations for the offices. If the clerk rejects an individual's nomination, the clerk uh, must notify all candidates for the offices as soon as possible, but the clerk's decision is final. And when you're withdrawing a nomination, a withdrawal must be filed with the clerk's office in writing before 2 p.m. on nomination day, which again is August 19th. If a nomination is withdrawn, the candidate is entitled to a refund of their nomination filing fee once they file their financial statement. And if a candidate withdraws a nomination, they're still required to file a campaign financial statement covering all of the financial transactions made in the campaign, even if the only financial transaction made was the nomination filing fee. So with regards to additional nominations, if there are fewer nominations than offices to fill by election at the close of nomination day, additional nominations may be filed and additional nominations can be received on August 24th, 2022, between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Um, for acclamations, the number of certified candidates for an office is equal to or less than the number of candidates to be elected for that office. Um, following nomination day, uh, candidates are declared acclaimed on Monday following nomination day, which is August 22nd. And then again, if there are additional nominations required, those acclamations are announced after 4 p.m. on the Thursday following nomination day, which is August 25th. So I just thought I'd throw in a few um, uh, little slides about spending limits. So the head of council limit, the spending limit is $7,500 plus uh, 85 cents per elector and the spending limit for expressions of appreciation um, or parties at the, end of, uh, at the end of the event is 10% of the general spending limit. And then for the other offices, the spending limit, uh, the formula includes $5,000 plus zero, uh, plus 85 cents per elector. And again, the spending limit for parties and expressions of appreciation is 10% of general spending limit. So we thought we'd put in a few, uh, just some interesting things about third party advertisers because they're, uh, they were just new in the last election. So this is another election where they're uh, relatively new. So third party means a person or entity who is not a candidate. Third party advertising is separate from any candidate's campaign and must be, to be done independently from a candidate. And third party advertisers who wish to spend money on advertisements during the election must register and file a financial statement. The following persons and entities are eligible to be registered as third party advertisers. An individual who is normally a resident of Ontario, a corporation that carries on business in Ontario, a trade union that holds bargaining rights for employees in Ontario, and only the following persons and entities are eligible to register as third parties. Um, registration for third party advertisers can be filed beginning May 2nd, 2022 until the Friday before voting day, which is October 21st, between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I have to leave you now. I have my other meeting. I've read this uh, this uh, submission, and uh, I, I have no problems with it. I would vote in favor if I were present during the voting uh, process. Uh, so thank you very much. I apologize for, for being double booked. Okay. Bye now. Thanks, Thanks Andy. Andy. Bye, Andy. <clears throat> So again, with regards to third party advertisers, the following are ineligible to register as a third party advertiser, a candidate whose nomination has been filed, a federal political party registered under the Canadian Elections Act or any federal constituency association or registered candidate at a federal election by that party, a provincial political party constituency association registered candidate or leadership contestant registered under the Election Finances Act as well as the Crown in Right of Canada or Ontario, a municipality or local board, a group association or business that is not a corporation and a registered third party advertiser who failed to file the necessary financial statement or exceeded spending limits in the last municipal election. So they're very similar to the candidates. 
Uh, the clerk, uh, in similar to candidates, must provide third party advertisers with an estimate of their general spending and spending limits on parties and expressions of appreciation. And the formula to calculate third party advertiser limit is $5,000 plus five cents per elector to a maximum of $25,000. So I thought I'd throw in something about restricted acts after nomination day, which is otherwise known as lame duck. <laughs> so councils can be restricted or otherwise in lame duck during two separate time periods. The first time period is after nomination day on August 19th, and then again after voting day on October 24th. And that's when the three quarter rule applies. So if three quarters of a seven member council is not returning, uh, we're in lame duck and that uh, the magic number for the town of Armpire council is six. And uh, what does lame, uh, the lame duck restrict? It restricts the appointment or removal of any officer hiring or dismissal of any employee, disposition of municipal property which exceeds $50,000 and incurring expenditures or liability which exceeds $50,000. And that is the, the exception with the uh, $50,000 is when the disposition of property and or liability was included in the budget adopted to prior, prior to nomination day. Um, the town has been in lame duck before, it has never been an issue because we have a very fulsome delegation of authority bylaw which allows the, uh, the CAO to do a number of things. I just thought I'd mention again to the viewing public, the voting method in this election, it's internet telephone, it's accessible, easy to use, anywhere, anytime voting. We have a voter help center for those that require connected devices and assistance that will be located at the town hall. Once again, we'll be proactive attendants at long-term care, retirements and seniors buildings. Uh, most importantly is for uh, electors in the town of Armpar to make sure they're on the voter uh, the voters list. And right now, if you want to, uh, to confirm that you are uh, the voter lookup, uh, all you have to do is type in voter lookup. You can find it anywhere. It's on our website and you, you put in your name and your address and it will tell you if you, you and anyone at that address is on the voters list. Voter eligibility, a uh, person is eligible to be an elector if on voting day they reside in the municipality or the owner or the owner of land there or the spouse of such owner or tenant, a Canadian citizen and are at least 18 years of age and are not pro prohibited by law. Um, if an elector is not on the voters list, they can make an application in writing to have their name added to the voters list and the clerk may determine what proof of eligibility is required in order for a person to be added to the list. I thought I would throw in a couple of, just a couple of interesting ones. This one is about uh, students. Uh, so students are the exception to the requirement that an elector may only have one permanent residence. A student may reside in one municipality in order to attend school, but have no intention of changing their permanent resident in another municipality. Therefore, a student may vote in both municipalities. And uh, with respect to homeless persons, for a person with no permanent lodging place, the following rules determine their residence. The place in which the person most frequently returned to eat or sleep during the five weeks pre preceding the determination. If the person returns with equal frequency to one place to sleep and another to eat, the place in which they sleep, and a declaration regarding the above is conclusive if there is not other information to the contrary. So those are just a few more interesting things I thought that we'd bring forward. But again, voting, uh, internet telephone, uh, opening of nominations. We're waiting for the for the rush of people to uh, to come into the office and bring in their forms. And uh, it, we're here until August 19th for that. And then it'll be uh, getting all of the election prepared and, and uh, seeing who's out there and campaigning and getting ready for voting day. I was thinking, Maureen, that this must be quite an exciting time for you and Kayla. <laughs> must be a lot of hard work here. You know, the interesting thing is it's it's a lot of work to lead up to it. And your greatest fear is that you will only have a um, a an election for a school board trustee. 
<laughs> I hate oh, to say that because that could very well happen. You could get all of the other uh, acclamations to office and you'd be running and have done all the work and all the expenses, I might add, for um, for a school board trustee. So it, uh, it makes it interesting, but, um, you know, we look forward to it and it's, uh, you know, democracy at its best. Oh, I know. I know. Thanks for all the work you do on this, I'll tell you. Chris, Chris. Just wonder, are there, I know you mentioned uh, going to long-term care homes. Are there advanced polls that are going to be happening uh, for election? Well, because it's uh, telephone internet, uh, we do the advanced voting 10 days in advance, right? So that's considered the advanced voting period. Okay. So really from October 14th until October 24th, it's 24-7. So that is considered the advanced voting period. Oh, that's perfect. And we're well, we're open all of that time, and we will have extended hours during that time too, Chris, in the office, um, some evenings, and we'll pop in on a Saturday morning for those that want to come in on those days to utilize our um, electronic devices in the in the council chambers. That's perfect. Have we partnered? Like, is the library offering anything as well for? Um, if people would be able to go there and do that. Uh, one year we did uh, one election. We did have someone on staff but it's very sporadic there. So it's um, as to if they need help or not. So it's generally those people that are just using the um, the internet that would go and vote there, but they certainly can for sure. Oh, okay. So the last election too, Chris, we did do um, for seniors residents. We actually went into a couple of the, of the apartment buildings oh, that nice. were like senior apartment buildings because we had some questions. So we actually went and sat in their common area for like a couple hours in an afternoon and let them come use the tablet and vote too. So. Oh, that's perfect. Probably set them at ease and yeah, we uh, yeah we do we do for sure the Villa the Grove um, and uh, we do Island View Suites. We do Baskin Drive Seniors, and then we have gone uh, to a lot of the uh, the housing units as well because there are a lot of seniors in there um, that uh, we can accommodate as well. So, so and then again, if anyone needs us to go, we will also do an in home visit. Um, or we can jump out to a car and pass the iPad through the, the window and we can do that as well. Yeah. We're pretty so flexible. You're going, to, you're going to continue to do that, right? Absolutely, Mer absolutely. Oh, that's wonderful for the seniors. That's yeah. really nice to hear. Yeah, yeah. That's for um, my and other, Kayla, oh. sorry, go ahead, Daryl, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, Kayla, that's something we should talk about at the Greater Arm <clears throat> Council. Would you? I will bring that up closer to the please? voting time, yep. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's an important one, Daryl, uh, for the seniors. And uh, I know in um, years ago when um, McNabb, uh, when Armbury Homes Seniors at Home had their lunches, we would go and do a little bit of a presentation too, just to tell them how easy it was. So I mean, we can we can look into that as well if they're if they're back doing that. Um, COVID has certainly made things a little bit more challenging, but we'll we'll definitely go to whoever. So. Thank you so much for that. Uh, my last one is just about uh, the student rule. Uh, I know there's a student rule for electors. Is there a student rule for candidates? I know locally we had uh, Councillor Jacobs in McNabb Brayside where he was going to school abroad, but his primary residence was Brayside. Do we have the same situation? Or we have it covered if that happened here in Armbrier? I, I guess I don't understand the question. <laughs> Like if uh, if someone was going to school out of province, but the yep. primary residence was here in Arnprior, are they able to run? Because uh, they kind of would have two permanent residences. Um, is that how? I think you're well, saying like Oliver went to school in Nova Scotia, but he was he ran as a counselor in here. Yeah, so he would be able to run because he's he's eligible to run. So he would be able to to vote for sure. But it would be a different election in down east, right? It wouldn't be an Ontario election. I was just thinking if if that situation happened here where someone from Armprior that was attending school somewhere else wanted to run for councillor of Armprior, would right. they still be eligible as a uh... an elector somewhere else? Sure. Yep. Yep. Like if they're a student at Queens. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. For sure. OK. And those experiencing homelessness, same rule if they want to register to be a uh, be a, a candidate. Um, is it the same criteria to be an elector as to be a candidate? Yes, it would be the exact same. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. That's all. That's all I had. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? 
If not, uh, I'm all in favor for accepting this report as information. Carried. Next one is uh, disconnecting from work policy. The Corporate Services Advisory Committee received the disconnecting from work policy presentation as information. Over, please, Chris. Daryl. Just pull up the presentation. Thank you very much. So tonight here, I'm here to talk about the disconnecting from work policy. So to give a bit of background, um, this is a new policy and a new requirement. So employers that employ 25 or more employees um, are now required to have a written policy on disconnecting from work. And we have to have that in place for all employees by June 1st of 2022. Um, so these uh, new requirements were added uh, right into the Employment Standards Act um, on December 2nd, 2021. So it's definitely a new requirement uh, coming down the pipe. So just to give a bit of background, the, the term disconnecting from work, what, what does that really mean? So in the Employment Standards Act, it is defined uh, to mean uh, not engaging in work-related communications, including emails, telephone calls, video calls, or sending or reviewing other messages, um, essentially to be free from the performance of work. So um, legally though, uh, it's always important to know that the ESC with this requirement, it does not require an employer to create a new right for employees to disconnect from work and be free from the obligation to engage in work-related communications and its policies. Um, those rights already um, exist under the ESA to not perform work, but they're established through other ESA rules. So for example, you know, your eating period when you're on lunch or a break or uh, when you're on vacation, um, public holidays, um, et cetera. So that, that, that right uh, already exists. It's not a new, a new right. Um, under the ESA legislation, um, it does require that as employers, we must provide a copy of the policy to all employees within 30 calendar days of the policy being uh, prepared, um, or if you do an amendment of the 30 days of the policy being changed. Um, also, when you have a new employee come on board, you have 30 calendar days to provide them a copy of that written policy. Um, now on an ongoing basis, uh, we don't have to provide a copy of the policy annually um, if it hasn't changed from the prior years to employees. Um, other requirements of the policy, it must include the date the policy was prepared and the date any changes were made to the policy. So interestingly, other than these requirements, that is um, the ESA does not specify the information that the employer must include in the policy, uh, nor does it specify the policy must be a particular length. So that's really all of the instructions that are provided in the ESA for employers. So um, at the end of the day, the employer itself determines the full content of the policy itself. So um, the written policy on disconnecting from work, it has to apply to all of the employees, employers, employees in Ontario. However, it doesn't mean that you have to have the same policy in place for all of its employees. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a couple of slides. So the employer can have a single policy that applies to all the employees, or you can have a policy that contains different policies and different instructions um, in a single document or multiple documents for different groups of employees. So you can have the, those um, segregations. What are some examples of what could get included in a disconnecting from work policy? Um, so really you wanna be outlining um, the employer's expectations um, if there's any, for employees to read or reply to work-related emails um, or answer work-related phone calls after a shift is over. Um, the expectations of an employer could be different depending on the situation. Uh, it could be the time of day of the communication might impact on um, the subject of the communication and who's contacting the employee, for example, is it you know, a supervisor, a colleague, um, or a client? And these things can be um, outlined in the policy. I'll give an example, oh, sorry. Um, so the, uh, the employer's requirements for employees, another example would be um, outlining in the policy. No, nope, Kayla's moving around. <laughs> it's okay, just stick to that one. Um, the employer's requirements for employees uh, turning on their out of office and notifications or changing their voicemail messages when they're not scheduled to work uh, to communicate they will not be responding until the next scheduled workday. So those are just examples of things that could be 
um, included in a disconnecting from work policy. So when we get a little more specific into the town of Armfire and the policy uh, we're developing, first thing we did was we took a look at what policies do we have currently in place already. So in place already, the town of Armfire has an hours of work policy. Um, and in this policy, um, the town recognizes that in order to meet operational requirements, um, there are some employees will from time to time be required to work beyond their normal hours of work. Um, that said, um, the town does um, endeavor to be a workplace of choice, and the purpose of the hours of work policy is to outline fair and appropriate compensation to all employees while being mindful of the town's accountability to the general public to provide quality service in an effective and efficient manner, because we all know we offer town services 24-7, so uh, this is what the hours of work policy tries to address. So for the town of Armpire, we see um, in the hours of work policy and we see when we're creating this disconnecting from work policy that employees' health and well-being are priorities while working, um, uh, while working and while away from work, um, and that we're committed to increasing the overall employee health and wellness and provide employees with that positive work-life balance. So uh, we really, the intent of that policy for the disconnecting from work is that we want to promote that ideal by specifically detailing what is the expectations um, related to disconnecting from work to make it clear for employees. So we talked a little bit about the two, maybe potentially a policy could address this differently for categories and employees. So if we, if we drop back to that hours of work policy that's already in place, the hours of work policy already defines our staff into two different categories. Um, one is a part-time, fixed term, or full-time non-supervisory. Um, employees who fall into these categories they are subject um, to hours of work, eating periods, and overtime pay provisions as per the Ontario Employment Standard Act. The secondary category of employees um, and that we have in the hours of work policy are what we call management professional. And, and staff that fall under the management professional category are not subject to hours of work, eating periods, or the overtime pay provisions of the ESA. Um, so that's how we kind of right now establish between the groups of employees. So in the disconnecting from work policy that we're currently drafting, we're looking to outline the expectations from an employer point of view from disconnecting from work. And we look to kind of break it down to those same groups to be consistent with the hours of work policy, where you have that management professional group, and then you have the other group that's the non-management professional group. Um, we would like the disconnecting from work policy to have a section on workload and productivity. Uh, we want to encourage uh, employees who are struggling to manage any work during their um, working hours to meet with their managers, evaluate their workloads, priorities, um, and due dates. The goal here is really to try and get employees to help avoid burnout, complete their normal duties within the regular working hours, remain productive, and meet goals and objectives. Um, in the disconnecting from work policy, we'd also like to include a communication section. Um, this is where we'll provide tips um, on how to set for employees to set those appropriate communication boundaries. Uh, we'll have a section for breaks and time off. Um, this in the policy will be encouraging employees uh, to take their scheduled breaks. Um, make sure you're taking your recruiter vacation time uh, to go rest and enjoy personal pursuits. Um, whenever an employee is on a, a break or a time off, such as a vacation, uh, they won't be obligated to be completing work related activities during that scheduled time off. Um, knowing that um, time management is the responsibility um, of the employees and they need to make sure that that scheduled time off though doesn't interfere with their deadlines. Um, so really I think it's a, it's, it's a combination of managers working with their employees really to be delegating those job specific duties that can be completed while the employee is on vacation to help maintain that workflow and productivity. Um, so for next steps for the disconnecting work policy, um, I wanted to get feedback from the uh, Corporate Service Advisory Committee from, from you uh, regarding this policy. Uh, once again, because the ESA doesn't um, uh, specify what's to be included, it is really um, a, some of the local municipalities, we've been all been doing some draft policies and trying to determine um, the appropriateness of what to put in the disconnecting work policy. Uh, we'll then be bringing forward this policy to council for approval at a May um, meeting of council. And then uh, we would roll it out to all staff and facilitate any training discussions uh, with staff regarding the policy after that. So with that, I was open for any questions or any feedback anyone has on the contents of what will eventually form the disconnecting from work policy. Jennifer, I don't understand any of it. I'm sorry, 
I'm sorry, group, I, I totally don't. Um, what is it? Disconnect from work. What, what are you talking about, Jennifer, when you're talking about this? Give, sure. me some, give me some real examples of it, please, for me. Yeah, so what it is, is um, the disconnecting from work is what they want employees to be able to do is they say that with um, people a lot of the time, let's just take COVID, a lot of people were working from home and a lot of people um, just in Ontario in general, I, I'm speaking in, in generalities, with people working from home or with people now with um, cell phones, with data on it and things like that, they find that a trend in Ontario is, is that employees are going home and then they're answering their emails, you know, at 10 o'clock at night and they're doing all these things and that, and that people aren't, and then the expectation, you know, comes, are you going to be answering those things at 10 o'clock at night? Um, and so it, this policy came, came about is from Ontario is that they want employees to have clear direction from their employers on when can you, not be looking at your phone or when can you not be um, doing those sorts of things and when can you just completely disconnect from work do your own personal pursuits don't you don't have to be worrying about you know what I mean um, checking those messages um, you know what I mean or doing anything of that nature I'll, I'll, I'll take one example that um, we'll be including in this policy so for example um, a clear expectation from the employer is we have here in town of Armfire an emergency management group so if there is an emergency that happens with the town, we have a call out procedure that happens and you get called in and we all form um, an emergency operations group that forms up um, at our emergency control center. So anyone who's formed with that group, you know, the policy would say the expectation is, is that if you receive a call that an emergency has happened, you need to come into that, even if it's after hours. So that would be an example of, you know, something we'd make sure goes into the policy where we're, uh, we're clearly saying, obviously, you have to attend this. You know what I mean? Thank you. If, if that um, helps, give an example. Yes, it helped me very much. Thank you. Okay. Now I understand. <laughs> it's definitely a new one. I had no, it's, it's a new oh, policy that, coming forward. That's, that's okay. And, and it's... Uh, and it's very important. I, I I can see that too. Yeah, totally get it. Thank you. Yeah, I don't envy. You. It's a lot of work, and I really see it as it's a political buzzword um, oh, yeah. because a lot of the stuff is covered by ESA and collective agreements, and they, for anyone that's non-supervisory. So I think we're you end up establishing a lot of things you're already doing. So. Uh, I don't know. I think it's a, it, it's a nice concept. It sounds really good on a bumper sticker, but uh, like you say, it, it's basically you have to have a policy in place. That's that's it. The contents of it, the government gave us no no uh, actual guidance on that. So uh, I think it's one for legal, and I don't know what more I can I can add for feedback to it. But except to wish you all the best. <laughs> Uh, in drafting well, 800 policies Chris, for different but, groups, yeah. But Chris, it's uh, at least it's a guideline, right? Isn't that what it's all about? There uh, is no good. That's the problem. The government didn't provide any guideline with it. They just said you have to have a policy in place, and uh, it's up to each employer to do it. So it's but, not necessarily that you get to disconnect because part of your job, like Jennifer said, may very well be that you cannot disconnect um, from work. So it's a it's a tough one. Um, yeah, but it sounds still, really nice. But we're doing something about it here. In the Absolutely, yeah. Fire, which, is, which is critical. My next question, Jennifer, really quickly, how many employees do we have in the town of Armprior? Oh. How many employees do you have right now? So, you know what I mean? That number really fluctuates uh, over a year. We have approximately 50 full-time. I think it is between 30 and 50. And then it fluctuates during the in the summer seasons. You got to think when we hire on, you know, a 20 plus summer students, you know, I mean, and you have lots of part time. So um, sometimes if you include part times and casual seasonals, you're we're probably up around the 100, 100 mark. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? If not uh, all in favor of accepting this uh, report for information. Carried. Next item is matters tabled. We don't have any staff reports. We don't have any. New business, nothing in new business, then adjournment. If I move to adjourn, Chris, Daryl, all in favor, we're adjourned.